Thank you. Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Richard Lockhead. To ask the Scottish Government how its budget will take account of promoting regional policy. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Whilst I am obviously constrained in what I can say today, I can confirm that the draft budget will respond to the challenges presented by the EU referendum and UK Government austerity, will deliver the positive steps set out in the programme for government to build a nation with a dynamic, sustainable and inclusive economy that supports all of Scotland's regions. Richard Lockhead. Well, I very much look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's statement, and I'm sure he will agree that we need a renewed focus on Scotland's regional policy as Brexit fast approaches, given that many regional funds flow from Europe. And whilst I recognise that city deals for Aberdeen and Inverness and elsewhere, along with the Islands Initiative, are big steps forward, does he agree we also need bespoke measures for places like Murray that I represent and elsewhere that are not covered by these initiatives but face similar challenges? And in terms of future budgets, will he support efforts in Murray to persuade the UK Government in particular, but also speak to him and his own colleagues in the Scottish Government, to deliver a Murray City deal? especially given the enormous revenues generated by the Speyside Scotch whisky sector for the UK's coffers? And finally, should we also be looking at other measures in promoting regional policy, such as locating civil service jobs, especially new ones, in places like Murray and elsewhere around the country? Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding officer, that was quite a comprehensive bid for the budget uh, tomorrow, but taking each issue in turn, of course, we should recalibrate our economic uh, policies in light of circumstances to, to support every part uh, of Scotland. On the issue of continuity of EU funds, I've guaranteed the continuity of EU funds, uh, and including following through from the UK uh, guarantees to Scottish Government. On city deals, I'm happy to work with uh, Murray Council to look at any specific request uh, that may emerge, and the economy sector also deals with uh, the city deals, and we'll be happy to engage. And on civil service, uh, Deployment. It is the case that we have, I think, uh, around 70 offices across the country, uh, not just in the central belt, but when we consider the, uh, the deployment of our resources and civil servants, uh, we will ensure that it, uh, it looks at opportunities in every part of the country, but optimising the quality of service and, of course, uh, best value, staying in mind. Adam Tompkins. Just yesterday, the Fraser of Allender in its most recent economic uh, commentary said the following. The scope of a city to invest in productive infrastructure, skills, land uh, redevelopment is essential to its ability to shape and manage population and economic change. The OECD observes, says Fraser of Allender, a, a strong correlation between fiscal decentralisation, prosperity and productivity. And there is mounting evidence that fiscal devolution or financial empowerment of cities creates an incentive framework that ultimately improves the economy and productivity. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? And if so, could he point to the Scottish Government policies that are designed to assist the realisation of these policy goals? Cabinet Secretary. I've got a great deal of uh, sympathy with that proposition around how the metropolitan district, how the cities are drivers for uh, the economy and regional growth. Uh, the one example I'll point to, as requested by Mr Tompkins, is the Glasgow City deal. I was a signatory on behalf of the Scottish Government when I was the Local Government Minister, and we're happy to talk further to Local Government uh, and COSL about further empowerment and economic packages that stimulate economic growth uh, along the lines that were suggested. Rona Mackay. Rona Mackay. I thought it was Rich. Did you not wish to ask a supplementary? I beg your pardon, yes, sorry. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Despite their claims, it would appear that the Tories are the only party obsessed with independence. Is this the wrong question? Sorry. That's why I was confused. Sorry. OK, well, I think we'll move on to question sorry. two. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what was discussed at the last meeting between the Finance Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Cabinet Secretary. We meet with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to continue work with businesses and business organisations to build a fairer and more prosperous Scotland. I last met with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce on the 1st of December as a guest at their annual event. 
The First Minister also in attendance announced that the Scottish Government will provide up to £400,000 to the Chambers to support new business-led trade missions and forge new trading alliances between Chambers both here and abroad, and this will boost the resource already committed by the Chambers network, complement the work of the Scottish Development International and contribute to our shared efforts to increase exports and internationalisation. Gillian Martin. In my area of the northeast of Scotland, we have energy innovation and technology that has the potential to be exported worldwide. How important are these international grants going to be given uh, to the Chamber of Commerce in terms of helping businesses to export, particularly in the light of Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I certainly know that the Chambers of Commerce uh, appreciated that grant, which uh, will support their work on internationalisation, building stronger networks, helping to do deals that will uh, export our produce and, and uh, indeed intelligence and, and improve on our productivity as well. Clearly aligned to our trade and investment strategies to support manufacturing, uh, support for the low carbon sector as well, and to encourage companies to, to export. So I think this is a very worthwhile uh, partnership for uh, us, the Chambers, uh, and will complement the work of SDI. Jackie Bailey. Having a more international outlook for exporting is indeed welcome. And whilst we've seen an expansion of hubs to encourage exporting, um, these are in Europe and not in the rest of the world. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell me, when will we see this investment in hubs in Europe matched in emerging markets across the world? I think that Jackie Bailey raises a, a fair point that our work in internationalisation must reach beyond Europe, but it is a very important market and our overall strategy uh, around trade, investment and internationalisation can cover every part uh, of the world, including the emerging markets. So there will be an increasing focus on growth opportunities wherever they exist, but certainly the Chambers appreciate the support we've given them uh, along the lines that I've suggested try and support our international efforts. Liam Kerr. Thank you. In September this year, organisations including CBI Scotland, the Scotch Whisky Association and the Institute of Directors wrote to the Finance Secretary to urge him to reverse the decision to double the rate of large business supplement in Scotland, which will affect one out of every eight commercial properties and add a further six million to these business rates bills in the current year. Who's right? Business groups of the SNP. Cabinet Secretary. I look forward to presenting the Scottish Budget tomorrow and I look forward to the ongoing engagement with the business community. Following the receipt of that letter, I met with business organisations and I said I would consider their propositions. So I look forward to a package of measures that will support the business community when I outline the Budget to Scotland tomorrow. Question number three, Kenneth Gibbs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact its forthcoming budget will have on Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary. As I've referred to in earlier answers, tomorrow I'll bring forward my tax and spending proposals. The people of Ayrshire, indeed people across Scotland, will benefit from our commitments to expand early learning and childcare, raise standards in schools and close the attainment gap, protect the police budget in real terms and increase the health budget. The draft budget will also progress our ambitious infrastructure investment programme set out in the programme for government, including significant investments in affordable housing, digital energy efficiency, transport and health. That includes further progress on the A737 Dorai bypass and continued support for Glasgow Presswick Airport. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, for that very positive answer. It would be worth how vital the Ayrshire growth deal is to Ayrshire's future prosperity, a deal that requires much needed improvements to our infrastructure and investment of over £350 million. Whilst well, so I'm delighted that the SNP Government has already agreed to work with all parties concerned, does he agree that the Chancellor's autumn statement was a missed opportunity to propose a matching commitment from Westminster and that supporting the Ayrshire growth deal will not only be good for Ayrshire but the Scottish and UK economies? And will the SNP government therefore lobby the Chancellor to reconsider, share our vision and back the Ayrshire growth deal in next year's spring budget? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I, I do believe if it was a, a, an omission from the UK government, uh, we will continue to pursue it with the UK government and the Economy Secretary will support us uh, in taking those steps to support the Ayrshire growth deal. John Scott. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Cabinet Secretary is well aware of the proposed Ayrshire growth deal so dependent on more than one budget as outlined by Mr Gibson in his line of questioning. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that expanding the existing but now full enterprise zones in Prestwick and Irvine as well as perhaps creating a new one in East Ayrshire is strategically important to job creation and business development across Ayrshire and will this 
be a priority in his budget tomorrow, and if not, at the next budget. Cameron Secretary. Uh, Mr Scott makes a, a valid point around a package of measures that can be involved in any growth deal, a, a package of levers to support economic growth, and that package of measures on, on infrastructure support, uh, business rates uh, and other areas, I'm sure that Mr Scott will welcome my budget when I present it to Parliament tomorrow. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The, the Scottish Government's own figures show that since 2007, 800 jobs have been axed to East Ayrshire Council, 600 at North Ayrshire Council and 800 at South Ayrshire Council. That's 2,200 job cuts on this Government's watch. Given that the Cabinet Secretary refuses to use the powers of this Parliament to stop the cuts to local councils, can he tell the Chamber how many more jobs will have to be axed in Ayrshire as a result of his forthcoming budget? And does he think those job cuts will be a price worth paying for families in Ayrshire? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, Colin Smith's uh, position on the use of these powers is uh, not accurate. I don't uh, support the proposition that's been put across. And I'd simply ask the member to reflect on the fact, as, as understood by the Independent Audit Agency, that local government has essentially had an equivalent reduction to their budget that the Scottish government has. So it is the case that local government has had fair and reasonable settlements from the Scottish government. Question number four, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what was discussed at the recent meeting between the Finance Secretary and the Chancellor. Cabinet Secretary. The First Minister and I met the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the 1st of December and discussed a range of issues, including the economic and fiscal uncertainty resulting from the EU referendum and the need for the UK Government to do more to support the oil and gas sector to secure its long-term sustainability. We also discussed the iniquitous treatment of Scottish Police Authority and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service with respect to VAT, an unacceptable situation which is estimated to cost the bodies around £30 million per annum. Following the meeting, the Chancellor committed to providing further details of his plans to adjust the UK budget and autumn statement timetable. Those details will be of significant interest to the joint working group that has been established to look at the Scottish budget timetable following the passage of the Scotland Act 2016. Ben McPherson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And in regard to the, the VAT point, I wondered if you could outline what progress was made at that meeting re in regard to introducing changes to VAT legislation through the Finance Bill that would enable our Scottish emergency services to recover VAT. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, the, the, the Chancellor uh, said he will consider the matter further, and I hope that when he considers the matter further, that he will realise that this is an unfair situation that Police Scotland is the only police authority in the UK that is unable to recover that. That isn't fair. And I, I would welcome the fact, I don't know why the Labour Party support the Tories on this position, but I would welcome the fact uh, that the Tory party, through its Chancellor, may well reconsider uh, their position. I think it would be a very welcome and fair move if they ensured that we could reclaim our VAT, and that would be right for Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Murder Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Was the Finance Secretary and his colleagues not well warned in advance of the creation of a centralised single police force that VA2 would be irrecoverable, but they went ahead nonetheless? Cabinet Secretary. You see, but you see, that the excuse that the UK Government used for this is because the money is not coming through local government resources. But there are a range of amendments that the UK Government has made to their agencies ah, to right. ensure that they escape VAT. But it doesn't seem to apply to Scotland. Why the unfairness, presiding officer? Why the unfairness? The Tories can fix this in Westminster and ensure that we get parity in Scotland for our valuable emergency services. Neil Findlay. When he met with the Chancellor today to discuss uh, public infrastructure funding, today the Guardian newspaper and the Ferret Online have exposed how the Scottish Government's failure to correctly interpret EU rules, EU rules will result in 932 million lost to public investment. And at the same time, private financiers are profiteering from, taxpayer, from the taxpayer via sky-high interest charges at a time when interest charges across the Western world are at a historic low. Is it now not abundantly clear that NPD is now is just another financial scam and that the only people who think it's a good idea are members of the Scottish Futures Trust and people around them who are going to make fortunes out of this scheme. Will the Cabinet Secretary uh, join me in calling for a committee of this Parliament to investigate the whole issue of NPD financing of our public services? 
Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, you would never know that PPP, in fact, it started off with the Conservatives as PFI. That was the worst regime possible. Then Labour had PPP. What we uh, supported, of course, uh, by the Labour Party totally uh, in office, our model was much better in terms of profit capping. And what we've been able to do is accelerate capital infrastructure investment to build schools and hospitals and community facilities and infrastructure that has been welcomed across yeah. Scotland. And we've also been perfectly transparent in how this is delivered and will continue to be transparent around how this is delivered. And I will say more about infrastructure tomorrow uh, in the budget. But of course we'll, wait, we'll make wise decisions uh, on our capital spending and infrastructure projects. But we'll continue to pay for the legacy of borrowing and profiteering that we inherited from first the Conservatives and then the Labour Party. Marie Todd. Marie Todd. To ask the Cabinet Secretary if he's received any communication from the Chancellor of Exchequer regarding his three specific asks for the oil and gas industry. Those were improved access to decommissioning tax relief, urgent clarity on the use of loan guarantees and measures to stimulate exploration, which were completely ignored in the autumn statement. Cabinet Secretary. It is the case that those requests uh, were ignored by the Chancellor. I have reinforced the point when I met him, and I'll continue to reinforce the point because I think it is important to the wider Scottish economy, and specifically in the North East, and maybe the Chancellor will revisit his position in the spring budget. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that there is constitutional stability. Cabinet uh, Secretary. <laughs> without a shred of self-awareness. Uh, membership of the EU is fundamental to the structure of devolution settlement in Scotland. The UK vote to leave the EU therefore has profound implications for our current constitutional arrangements. This uncertainty is compounded by the apparent intention of the UK government to pursue a hard Brexit and take the UK and Scotland out of the single market. The Scottish government is clear that the future constitutional arrangements of Scotland must reflect the views and choices of the people of Scotland. And the people of Scotland voted clearly to maintain our relationship with the EU. The Scottish government will therefore be publishing shortly proposals to achieve that end and for further devolution to this parliament to protect the interests of the people of Scotland on the UK leaving the EU. Rachel Hamilton. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Former First Minister Alex Salmond said a constitutional crisis might be an extremely good thing for Scotland. It would seem that he seeks to encourage a constitutional crisis to block Brexit which SNP MSP Alex Neil has pointed out, many SNP voters support, including himself, and to link Brexit with a second independence referendum as a formality. When will the Scottish Government start listening to Scottish voters and acknowledge that Scottish independence is not wanted? Yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Not, not only are the Tories obsessed with Scottish independence, they're now obsessed with the two Alexes. You know, it's the position that the ball is in the court of the UK government. We'll put forward proposals that reflect the democratic interests for the people of Scotland, respecting and listening to the people of Scotland who voted to remain within the European Union. And if you focus on nothing else, surely it should be the single market that the Tories once believed in. Now, we'll put forward that proposition and the ball is in the court of the UK government to respond positively. And I hope for the sake of a number of matters, including constitutional certainty, that the Tories take this proposal seriously and help us provide further stability, which is what is required at this time. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Scottish Futures Trust regarding school rebuilding in Edinburgh. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, government officials met with the Scottish Future Trust uh, regularly uh, to manage the delivery of the Schools for the Future programme, which includes four new school projects in Edinburgh. The Scottish Government is currently providing significant investment of £62.6 million to the City of Edinburgh Council through the programme, with the Council being the third largest beneficiary from the programme. Daniel Johnson. Thank you for that answer, and I hope that conversations continue between Edinburgh City Council, the SFT and the Scottish Government to ensure the way for schools like Liberton High School, my constituency, are rebuilt. 
However, revelations in today's guardians that NPD is to be investigated by auditors is both awkward, but will certainly give parents and teachers no confidence that the money is on its way. So what impact will this have on projects like Liberton High School and others across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say, first of all, I think in relation to Liberton High School, it's a very sensitive matter uh, specifically, and we should all reflect on that. But on the more general political point of school building at the hands of the Scottish Government, 651 school building projects have been completed during the last nine years. That's 2007-8. Uh, to 2015-16 and by comparison this is almost double the amount of schools that was 328 completed over the preceding eight years so this government has invested substantially in a school building and refurbishment uh, program and will continue to do that in dialogue uh, with local government right across Scotland. Thank you very much we're going to move on to economy jobs and fair work questions now and we'll start with that. question number one from Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to remove the barriers to employment for people with a disability. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. In a Fairer Scotland for Disabled People, our delivery plan published on 2nd of December, we announced the range of actions to support disabled people into work, including the long-term ambition of setting a target for reducing the employment gap between disabled and non-disabled people, both in the private and public sector, the use of new powers over employability to support disabled people into employment. Our transitional service from April 2017 through Work for Scotland will allow us to take a fairer approach to that support and help 3,300 disabled people. A commitment effective immediately for modern apprenticeships to include the highest level of funding disabled young people at the age of 30 and building an SCV on inclusion in Scotland's pilot programme for providing disabled people with 120 employment opportunities in the third and public sectors and in politics between 2017 and 2021. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Does he agree that supporting disabled people into work not only helps them as individuals, but benefits the whole economy and businesses themselves too, and stands in sharp contrast to the treatment of disabled people by the UK government, described by a UN committee as systematically violating the rights of disabled people? Minister. Well, I, I absolutely agree with the, the fundamental point that uh, Willie Coffey makes in terms of as uh, missing out on much talent by not ensuring more disabled people are involved in the labour market, we're missing out on their ingenuity, their creativity, their innovation. Clearly, greater participation would be uh, good for the health and well-being of such individuals, but we also know it would be good for uh, employers and our overall uh, economy. In terms of this uh, latter uh, point about the different approach that we might be able to take uh, here in Scotland, we've said it very clearly that we're taking a, a very different approach with our devolved employment programme as, to, as opposed to what we've seen at the hands of the UK government and I've already set out the range of action that we're taking to try and improve in, uh, the participation of disabled people in the labour market. Annie Wells. Thank you. In Scotland, the statistics rates for disability unemployment vary substantially across the country, whereas in the Shetland Islands, the disability employment rate is nearly 88% and in Glasgow, it's less than 25%. What action will the Scottish Government take to address these vast differences? Yeah, Minister. Well, I've set out a, a clear direction of uh, travel uh, in terms of uh, our ambitions, and uh, 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 we will continue to pursue that. I'll tell you what we wouldn't have done, though, President Officer, and it's very telling that Annie Wells pointed out the, uh, the significant proportion of those who are disabled and unemployed in Glasgow, the city she represents. If we had control of the Job Centre Plus, we wouldn't be shutting eight uh, job centres down in that city right now. Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. On that specific matter, Minister, I met with the PCS Union on Monday along with MP colleagues. They tell me they're particularly worried about the future for ESA claimants at job centres if those eight job centres do indeed close, including my constituency in Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn, uh, the job centre in Maryhill Road. The DWP told the PCS crazily that forcing vulnerable constituents with mobility issues to travel longer distances will, have, will be an incentive into work. Just crazy. Can I ask the Minister whether the Scottish Government will support calls that have been made to halt this process and to have a rethink, a fundamental rethink by the DWP? Minister. Well, uh, let me say, I know this is an important issue to, to Bob Doris, given his constituency uh, interest, that we have uh, interest to all uh, Glasgow representatives. I have uh, been able to make contact with uh, Damien Green, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. I have been keeping uh, MSPs and uh, MPs who represent Glasgow up to date in relation to that correspondence. In terms of the point that Bob Doris made about these changes acting as an incentive 
for people into work. I think that tells us more about the DWP's attitude to human beings than it does anything else. I, I would absolutely agree with uh, Bob Doris's point about the impact on uh, those service users. I met with PCSL today to discuss that. And there's also another point in terms of the, the Scottish Government's position here, uh, President Officer, because the Smith Commission spoke of increased joint management for the uh, Scottish Government over Job Centre Plus. And in this matter, we had no prior notification, no meeting, uh, no letter, no uh, call, no email over this matter. So I'll be meeting with uh, Damien Green at the Joint Ministerial Group for Welfare in January, along with Angela Constance. And this will certainly be a matter I'll be raising. Daniel Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. According to the Scottish Commission for Learning Disability, the number of unemployed adults with learning disabilities known to local authorities is over 50%. So what will the Scottish Government do, rather than what it won't do, in as he responds to, uh, to Annie Wells, about this? And does the Minister agree that this figure is just too high? Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree the figure is uh, too high. I certainly would concur with that point from... And Mr Johnson, indeed, I think uh, the wider uh, employment rate for those with a disability, any disability in Scotland, is uh, too high. And I think we need to be doing uh, rather better in that regard. I've already set out the actions we propose to take as part of the, the Fair of Scotland for Disabled People, our delivery plan. But I can also tell them right now uh, we have the Open Doors uh, Consortium, which is a, a provides specialist in-work support uh, for a range of people. And that works with organisations like Action and Hearing Loss. Uh, the Scottish Association for, Association for Mental Health, RNIB, and crucially in respect to those with learning disability, it works with Enable as well. So we are undertaking some action just now. We'll continue to take more, and uh, Mr Johnson and indeed any other member has innovative suggestions, we'll always be happy to hear them, Presiding Officer. Question number two, George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has made of the impact on the Scottish economy of the UK Government's Brexit strategy. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Governments, the UK Government's Brexit strategy, and presenting us, I use the word strategy in its loosest possible sense, um, to date has increased the chances of a so called hard Brexit. The Scottish Government analysis published on the 23rd of August, drawing on a research base of a range of external organisations, suggests that under a hard Brexit, Scottish GDP could be up to £11.2 billion per year, lower by 2030 than it would be if Brexit did not occur. Uh, such an adverse shock to our economic performance would reduce earnings, unemployment, sorry, reduce employment, tax revenues and in turn the funding available for public services. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Cabinet Secretary will no doubt agree with me that with the Tory government in Westminster currently having no strategy in Brexit, seeing as this is the festive season and the hope that there can be a Christmas miracle, wouldn't it be good for the Scottish economy if there was at least one idea provided of strategy being undertaken by the Westminster government? Cabinet Secretary. The I think Mr Adam makes a very good point and I think if you see the hardening of attitudes amongst the other 27 members uh, of the EU you can see the effects of not putting forward any proposals. The ev economic evidence is clear that the hard Brexit outside the single market is the biggest threat to the economic prosperity of Scotland including Paisley and indeed all of the UK. Despite repeated calls from the Scottish Government, the UK Government has yet to provide any transparency over its Brexit strategy, creating uncertainty for businesses across the country. For our part, the Scottish Government is clear that remaining in the single market is the best option for Scotland and for the UK as a whole. And as such, we will very shortly present our proposition focused on keeping us in the single market. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what specific actions the Scottish Government is taking to capitalise on the opportunities arising from Brexit and how much money has been provided to Scottish business from the 500 million growth fund announced by the Scottish Government over three months ago? Cabinet Secretary. I think in parliamentary answers, if Dean Lockhart cares to check them, he will see the progress that we're making towards the establishment of the Scottish uh, Growth Scheme. Uh, I think in addition to that, he will also have seen announcements from the Scottish Government whereby we are increasing the representation uh, of uh, SDI over coming months to make sure that we have a stronger representation uh, throughout the EU and also with the hubs in London, Dublin uh, and in Berlin. And in response partly as well to the point made by Jackie Bailey previously, uh, uh, ministerial visits to Abu Dhabi uh, supporting up to 80 Scottish companies interested in oil and gas and other industries as well. Uh, also in relation to India, for example, talking to 100 CEOs there. So a substantial amount of work. But can I say that hardly a day goes by without a study, uh, one study or other, showing that we expect to have increased costs, um, poorer employment prospects, poorer investment prospects, poorer confidence, 
by people other than this government saying that they think Brexit is very bad, both for Scotland and for the UK. And I just wonder how long it can be before the Brexit deniers that we have in the Conservative Party start to realise that they have now moved well to the right uh, of for Margaret Thatcher, uh, and they, having been toxic for 35 years, are about to experience the prospect of being toxic for a very long period because of their hard-right attitudes and the economic self-harm they are doing to Scotland and to the UK. Question number three, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, to Sorry, Mr. President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what information it provides to employers regarding apprenticeship accreditation. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. All Scottish Government funded modern apprenticeship frameworks must be approved by the Modern Apprenticeship Group before they are available for delivery. They are developed through strong consultation with employers reflecting sector needs as defined by employers. When frameworks are approved, this is communicated to employers via direct engagement with them, the training provider network, and to other sector bodies involved in the development. The information is also published on Skills Development Scotland's website. Sandra White. I thank the Minister for that reply. The Minister will know that there are certain careers that are not apprenticeship accreditation. Uh, for example, tattoo artists, although they do a two-year apprenticeship. Uh, can I therefore ask the Scottish Government if they would consider looking at apprenticeship of this type? to be accredited under apprenticeship schemes? Minister. Well, uh, President Officer, we will always be very willing to consider such matters. I should say uh, and reiterate the point I uh, set out in my initial answer to, to Sandra White, uh, any uh, uh, modern apprenticeship framework has to be approved by the modern apprenticeship uh, group. I'm aware that uh, many employers will deliver their own uh, apprenticeships if they want to see that uh, approved as uh, part of our modern apprenticeship offer, then they should first of all engage with Skills Development Scotland. But if Sandra White wants to, to pick up on this specific point with me directly, I'd be very happy to speak with her. Liam Kerr. Thank you. A recent Scottish Government consultation on the apprenticeship levy found industry support for using the extra funds to support its target of 30,000 modern apprenticeships. A few weeks ago, I visited Score Group in Peterhead, who have the largest private modern apprenticeship programme in Scotland, and they reiterated that point. So will the Scottish Government use 100% of the apprenticeship levy funds from the UK Government to invest in, in, in apprenticeships? And when will we hear on their proposed policy to ensure that funds are used at approved regional training providers and not just colleges? Yes. Well, let me say I'm rather surprised to see uh, Mr Kerr raise the matter of the apprenticeship levy at all. It's well seen he's uh, hiding up the back of the chamber, because even he must be a little ashamed to have raised this, because it was only... A few weeks ago, we heard from the Conservatives that this levy was going to see £300 million worth of funding come to the Scottish Government. Well, we know that's not the case. There's an additional £79 million. We also saw when it was announced the, uh, the £221 million, the UK Government failed to set out that it's largely replacing existing expenditure. They also saw them fail to point out that it's going to cost the public sector yeah. some £73 million, which reduces the Scottish Government spending leeway by some £30 million. And uh, Mr Kerr is quite correct. We did engage in a consultation on how we respond to the introduction of the apprenticeship levy, which is rather more than the UK Government did yeah. when they introduced it in the first place. They spoke to no one, including this Scottish Government, without responsibility for delivering apprenticeship policy, and they spoke to no one who will be paying the levy, President Officer. When we are taking something forward, we do things rather differently. Yeah. Yeah. Question number four, Mary Evans. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the Aberdeen City Region deal. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Government, UK Government and regional partners signed the Aberdeen City Region deal on the 21st of November 2016. The signing of the Aberdeen City Region deal and the release of funding allows the deal to move on to the delivery stage and make proposals a reality. The Scottish Government has committed to investing up to £125 million over the next 10 years. The City Region deal funding will support investment in innovation, internationalisation, digital connectivity and infrastructure across the City Region. Mary Evans. Two major infrastructure projects were named within the Aberdeen City Region deal within my constituency of Angus North and Mearns. Uh, that included rail improvements at Oozen and Montrose and the Lawrence Kirk Junction. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update and more detail on the options for rail improvements at Oozen, given that it acts as a bottleneck and is restricting capacity in the North East? And can he also outline and explain the processes to be followed leading up to the construction of the Lawrence Kirk Junction? I've had a number of constituents contact me who are concerned at the 2021, uh, the earliest possible construction date for that, and an explanation of the process would be very helpful. Thank you. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, happy to do so. I should say, though, that um, those two projects which are mentioned by Mary Evans are not actually part of the city deal. Uh, the Scottish Government wanted them to be part, but the UK Government balked at the size of the contribution they would have to pay towards additional uh, elements of the city deal. So they stand outside the city deal, but they were, as Mary Evans rightly says, mentioned at the same time. So that's a further £254 million, I think, in investment from the Scottish Government, over and above the £250 million that we will jointly share with the UK Government. Uh, Transport Scotland is currently taking forward design development work for improvements to the A90 at Lawrence Kirk, with a preferred option expected to be identified in 2018, leading to publication of draft orders in 2019. Uh, progress thereafter, of course, is dependent on the level and the nature of representations received in response to the published draft orders, and subject to, of course, no objections being received, it's estimated that the earliest construction could commence is in 2021. Uh, as Mary Evans knows, I've con uh, conversed with her on this subject this morning in committee and have undertaken to provide further written um, accounts of what I've just said, and I'm happy to do that. The development of rail infrastructure options are ongoing, and these include consideration of opportunities to increase capacity on the single track section between Montrose and Usain. Our focus, however, remains firmly on maximising the benefits for rail passengers in Aberdeen. The timescales for delivery remain in line with the previous commitments, with implementation from the next rail control period starting in 2019. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President. Officer, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined the benefits that will be delivered through uh, this particular um, city region deal. We have seen similar benefits in relation to Glasgow and Clyde, also um, Inverness and, and Highland are pursuing their own agenda in this uh, regard. Would the Cabinet Secretary be able to uh, highlight or, or update the Chamber on the progress being made in relation to an Islands deal, uh, where similar benefits can then be uh, reaped by Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I should say that uh, discussions, of course, have taken place, but we do have to proceed in relation to city deals with the partners that we anticipate being part of those deals. So with the UK government and also with the relevant island, in this case, island authorities. As was mentioned previously by uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, I asked the UK government through uh, Andrew Dunlop, Lord Dunlop, who's the, the lead on these things, to ensure that the Ayrshire growth deal was mentioned in the Chancellor's statement during the autumn statement, uh, and was very disappointed that it wasn't. Um, I think Liam MacArthur will be aware there is a, a timeline, a sequence for the deals which have been discussed so far. So the ones that were mentioned in that statement were the Stirling and Clipmanager deals, uh, as well as uh, Edinburgh and the Tay Cities deals. Further discussions on deals re will require all those parties to be involved in that. The Scottish Government has made clear that we are willing to discuss city deals uh, with anybody bringing forward proposals. I think these things are best done if we can maintain that partnership with the UK Government and subject to the sign that they are also interested in doing this, uh, we will continue to work with them. I should say, and we've made plain to the Ayrshire authorities, I know that's not the subject of uh, Liam MacArthur's question, but it does, because of the sequencing that I've mentioned, impact upon further discussions with the islands, that uh, if it is the case the UK Government starts to draw back from that, then we will see what we can do jointly working with those Ayrshire authorities. Question number five, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government how many jobs are directly or indirectly linked to the pub sector in Scotland. Right, Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, according to the 2015 Business uh, Register and Employment Survey, published on 28th of September of this year, uh, approximately 30,000 people are employed directly in the public houses and bar sector in Scotland, equating to approximately 20,000 full-time equivalent employees. Uh, applying the Food and Beverage Services Employment Multiplier from the latest published Scottish Government input output tables, it's estimated there are further 2,400 FTE jobs across full-time or part-time roles that are supported in the supply chain uh, for the sector, producing an estimated total of 22,400 FTE direct and in indirect jobs in the Scottish economy. Neil Bibby. Thank the Minister for that answer. Reform of the Thai pub sector is crucial to protecting jobs in the pub industry. Many in the sector such as Camera and the Scottish Licensed Trade Association have expressed serious concerns that the recently published Scottish uh, Government study, commissioned by the previous Minister on this issue, is of extremely limited value. The concern that uh, it featured only 25 pubs, only 10 pubs of which were fully tied and none of which were free of Thai tenanted pubs. Uh, the Minister is aware that I am proposing to bring forward a Members' Bill on Thai pubs. Would the Minister agree it would be wrong for the Government to rule out legislation in this area until a full and robust consultation has taken place? And would he agree to meet with me to discuss the issue of pub sector reform? Minister. 
Well, I recognise the, the importance of the, the, the study and the evidence base to be established in deciding policy going forward. The, the independent study that uh, Neil Bibby refers to uh, by uh, CGA strategy into the pub sector uh, was published in December, uh, 6th of December uh, this year on the Scottish Government website. And we are planning to engage uh, with the pub sector interests to discuss the, the findings of this research and how we can work together to create a more successful uh, sector going forward. We've not come, it's worth stressing, we've not yet come to a view uh, on this issue, and that's why we're, uh, why following the findings of the research, I intend to meet with a wide range of stakeholder interests to take their views. And I'm very happy to meet with Mr. Bibby uh, to hear of his, uh, his points in, in regards to the research. But I also want to stress the Scottish Government are still open to taking empirical research and evidence where that can be provided uh, to help. Inform the discussions on the issue.